we'll just we'll just roll with it. Hi everyone, if you are watching, uh, we are going to take a few minutes to set up. Usually, I put up a graphic at this point, um, but we're mobile, <laughs> so everything's a little, uh, you know, off kilter. Um, I'm Nicole Gallucci. I'm postdoc with the CosmoQuest Citizen Science Project. This is Learning Space. We are a weekly hangout slash podcast uh, talks about different uh, topics and issues in science and astronomy outreach and education. Um, we took off the last couple weeks. I was hoping to post some videos of cool ice and snow science, uh, but unfortunately I had a really bad flu. That's my excuse so I'm sticking to. Um, so uh, we took off two weeks for the holidays, but uh, we're back with a live impromptu, not at our usual time show, uh, with the astronomy ambassadors from the American Astronomical Society meeting in uh, near Washington, D.C. this year. Got the hashtag for the meeting underneath me, AAS223. Lots of great tweets and discussion happening uh, with regards to um, astronomy, uh, astronomy education, astronomy the science, uh, science policy, budgets, everything you can think of. Uh, so I am joined as well by Catherine Williamson. Hi. <laughs> Yay. So she is actually set up on the other side of the ballroom from me so that hopefully <laughs> we don't uh, get in each other's mics and echo. Uh, we've got at least two more, possibly three more astronomy ambassadors joining us. We just last minute changed the location uh, as as they rightly pointed out to me that the uh, lobby will probably start making music and noise really soon and we're near the elevators so uh, we picked an acoustically better spot so you guys rock because I did not think of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe we can get started really quickly with Catherine and an introduction, who you are, what you do, where sure. you work. Um, yeah, go, go ahead with that. Sure, yeah. Um, my name is Catherine Williamson. I am the Public Education Specialist at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory and um, the NRAO for short, yep. NRAO has several sites kind of scattered around the United States um, and I'm in Green Bank, West Virginia. So our sort of pride and joy there is the uh, Green Bank Telescope, which is a huge radio dish that has a surface area of 2.3 acres, just to kind of give you some scale there. So yeah, happy to be here. And it's very nice, it's very good to meet you because you just started working at the NRAO in May. I did. Uh, and, and I used to spend a lot of time in Green Bank and, and love it out there. So yeah, it's exciting. definitely an interesting place. Um, it's in the National Radio Quiet Zone. So uh, cell phone signals aren't really around, <laughs> um, at least close to the observatory. And um, when you're on observatory property, not, you're not even allowed to have wireless internet, microwaves, wireless phones. <laughs> it's so it's a, cool it's a new way of living for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to remind you guys, if you're watching, please share the link. We love when you share things. Uh, if you want to uh, send a comment or question, uh, apparently I screwed up the Q&A app again. They changed it <laughs> again. Um, but I will be trying to watch the comments on YouTube and on the Google Plus event page. So please say hi. Uh, feel free to ask questions and, and leave a comment uh, there for us. So the pro so the, the group of people I got together are all uh, Astronomy Ambassadors, which is a program that started uh, last year, I think, at the American Astronomical Society meeting uh, as a program to train and teach um, young astronomers uh, to do more effective outreach and, and be confident in doing outreach and uh, build a community of outreach. Um, so so I, I know if you've watched this show, you know I love it, obviously. <laughs> um, but maybe uh, I want to hear from Catherine a little bit about why you applied to be in this program. Yeah, yeah. Um, as the public education specialist for the NRAO, um, I definitely care about outreach and um, being the best at that that I can be. And I really liked this program because um, we had hands-on opportunities to practice communication um, and, and how the, the ideas that are in our heads don't always translate to the people we're trying to teach exactly as we would expect it to. Um, and I also really liked this workshop because we got a lot of hands-on activities that we could do and we got to practice doing them. So um, I'm definitely going to use the things I learned 
uh, to go back to the observatory and help kind of actually train more ambassadors. So college students around West Virginia, West Virginia to, um, to be better science communicators and to um, really have the skills and knowledge that they need to go out and interact with people that are that may be really different from them and to really try to find that point of connection with whatever audience that they that they might encounter. Very cool. Now you, um, so you're speaking about uh, training undergrads in West Virginia, uh, you also presented on a program you worked on in Montana where yeah. you were recently a grad student. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, the program that um, we're doing in West Virginia that's modeled after the Montana program is called the Space Public Outreach Team, or SPOT for short. And we uh, recruit and train undergraduate presenters to learn science or astronomy, space science themed presentations that feature science that's going on in each respective state. So in West Virginia, clearly, we want to highlight the GBT because that's awesome. So um, yeah, and so the kind of idea is to send these presenters out to schools, um, preferably free of charge for the schools, and you know get go anywhere, lots of rural places that don't get this kind of attention, and just let you know students know that hey, this stuff is really cool, and it's being delivered by a cool college mentor or college role model, and um, you don't have to go far from home to do real science or to be part of the scientific endeavor and to be an astronomer and to be part of world-class research. So um, so that's kind of the main message and um, it's kind of just good for everyone because <laughs> um, you know the kids love it, they love seeing um, a cool mentor, a cool role model. The college students love it because they really see um, the inspiration that they can instill in student and young kids. They get great professional development um, experience and the uh, the teachers love it because it generally fits in the next generation science standards and so it fits in their curriculum. Um, the institutions around you know, the state love it because it's like advertisement for all the great work they do and it has like that broader impact side to most of the grants that you would want for your education programs. So it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you put out, uh, sorry, I'm also tweeting the other two. They don't know what room we're in. <laughs> Whoopsie. Yeah, well, I can talk a little bit more about Spot. <laughs> yes, because uh, you put you put, you particularly uh, gave a very uh, uh, you inspired me to or try to inspire the audience to come up with a Spot program in every state. So yes, talk a little bit more about that while I make sure the other two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think I think it would be awesome if we had um, sort of a, a like cadre of presenters that could go around every state um, within every state and inspire all the kids there because in Montana the program's been going on for about 17 years and um, we reach about an average 10,000 Montana students per year. Um, that's really a huge number when you think of it in context with some of the other um, public, public outreach endeavors that we try to do and the cost is so small. It only costs about seven dollars per student. So, um, so it's really like large scale and low cost and pretty sustainable. Um, so, uh, yeah. So I definitely encourage you know if you're interested in astronomy education and outreach, um, or if you're you're like a scientist and you just want to kind of like get involved a little bit more to just start talking to people at your institution or um, definitely the space grant in your state because each state has a space grant. Like I've been finding a lot of people don't know this great resource that they have. Um, and you can just start getting the ball rolling and I'm definitely happy to help serve as like a point of contact or whatever if you just need some more information about that. No, no, it's broken. <laughs> oh, awesome, awesome. Okay. So we just, we are being joined uh, by, I, I'm so sorry, I lost you guys. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry guys. Um, so uh, I have with me Sebastian, I'm going to screw up the pronunciation. Sebastian Guillot. Guillaume. Okay, yeah. so that's all easier than that. Sebastian Guillaume, and we also have Meredith Rawls. Hello. I can also <laughs> Yes, we all have name tags, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, first of all, I want to uh, do a quick shout out to Guido Bibra. Hi, Guido. Uh, you, he is watching the Stargazing Live with Chris Hadfield. Awesome. On BBC while watching us as well. Thank you for including us with them. Uh, and uh, also, yes, noting, noting that uh, Tony Darnell, Deep Astronomy, has been doing a lot of live broadcasting from 
uh, the double AS as well. So check out his stream. Uh, we love Toadie. We give him hugs. Um, yes, my, my laptop screen sometimes blacks out. Okay. <laughs> so I keep it low. It's scary. Uh, anyway, uh, so maybe Sebastian, you want to. Uh, oh, hey, we have another person. Hey. Come on over. Sorry, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I see that it does that. <laughs> yeah, come. Yeah, bring a chair over. Um, go over there and. Right. Sorry, this is all kinds of we. We also have a summer ash. You may know. Hey, summer ash. We, we you may know more than one. A lot of these awesome people from from Twitter as well. I hope. Does that work? I'm kind of. <laughs> all right. Okay, I don't want to move the computer again. <laughs> Okay, so Sebastian, tell us about yourself, what you work on, where you, where are you from? Yeah, so I'm uh, from Montreal. I study at McGill University, and two years ago we started a group uh, with Ryan Lynch, a postdoc at McGill University. Former UVA student. <laughs> woop, woop. <laughs> <laughs> we started a group uh, really dedicated to organizing a bunch of outreach activities. So now we have uh, about 10, 15 volunteers, more or less fully dedicated, uh, and we have uh, public series of uh, lecture and uh, observing nights. We go to primary school for activities, and we have also a podcast series. So you can look for it on mm -hmm. iTunes Astro McGill podcast. Yeah, uh, you guys we, do We have like something stuff. like 42 episodes already. So. Nice. Wow. Nice. <laughs> so and McGill is located in Montreal, in Montreal. Canada. So, so yeah, definitely go visit and do mm -hmm. awesome local resource. Um, <coughs> sorry, so you... Uh, we're so so. Uh, we were just hearing from Catherine. Catherine and I are new astronomy ambassadors, mm -hmm. but you have been in the program for a while. So maybe you can tell us uh, what it's been like uh, for the past year. To be yeah. Part so of the Meredith and I joined the first cohort last year at the AAS uh, in Long Beach, uh, the first cohort of the astronomy ambassador program. And so it was the first one. So there were things that were not uh, perfect, but the program was really good altogether. Uh, we had a lot of uh, I don't know, uh, tips to organize outreach activities, a lot of uh, activities also to organize in schools. Uh, the forum worked pretty well, kind of interaction between the different uh, ambassadors, and I liked it. So I, came, I tried to come back this year for uh, to interact with a new student, the new uh, cohort, sorry. Cohort, that's what we're being called? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, a cohort. <laughs> we're a cohort, I like it. Um, Meredith, since you want to talk, tell us a little bit about yourself down there. Um, and you're also one of the first cohort of the Astronomy Ambassadors as well. It's true. Um, so I'm a, a graduate student um, at New Mexico State University. Um, I study binary stars. Um, and uh, I was in the first group, or cohort, I suppose, with Sebastian last year. Um, and it was, it was really a neat, it was a neat experience because uh, I heard about it just to think online. I saw a thing for it, and I was like, well, I like outreach, and this is a program for people who want to do more outreach, so that sounds neat. <laughs> um, and it was really cool because we got to do all these different um, activities, like you were saying, um, and we got to like plan a little program as if we were doing an outreach activity, kind of role playing, um, and uh, we got to just learn a whole bunch of new um, new activities that we can do for people of all ages. Um, it was just a really cool, it was a really cool experience, and I was glad to get to come back this year and visit you guys <laughs> and see see how the program's improved. Yay! Yes, it was good to hear from you guys. We had a little lunch panel session mm -hmm. with you guys talking about mm -hmm. it. Uh, and Summer, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Summer is also one of the new cohort <laughs> with, with me and Catherine. So. Cohort too. Yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, so I'm the director of outreach at Columbia University in the astronomy department. And that program, uh, the outreach program at Columbia, got started by the grad students over the last 10 years and sort of gained a lot of momentum um, and to the point where now it's part of the culture really mm -hmm. which is really fun because incoming graduate students here like this is what we do <laughs> um, and it, it's gotten to the point where we have a really broad spectrum of programs we have um, public nights twice a month we have schools that come visit us on a case-by-case -case basis like as we can host them um, and we have a program that takes grad students into middle schools and talks about um, a day in the life of an astronomer. Because in middle school you sort of know astronomy, but yeah. you don't really know what that means to be an astronomer. Um, and we also have a program that pairs grad students with teachers in high schools who run astronomy clubs. Um, and so then that pair has an ongoing relationship as long as the graduate students at mm -hmm. Columbia. And that, that is uh, something that they uh, really stressed 
uh, I think in the in the um, in the workshop, and this is something that well, Ryan and I came from University of Virginia. It was mm -hmm. stressed as well uh, to d build continuing relationships. Right, a lot of us do one-off outreach events, and they're cool and they're, they they can be inspiring. But um, there was uh, a big push to build sustained relationships. So Absolutely. Okay. So so you're already doing that. Yeah. So Columbia. we're doing that. We do that in the one program. Mm -hmm. It's called Rooftop Variables because mm -hmm. the idea is that. Um, we, we actually give the teacher a telescope um, with a camera and a laptop um, that they can potentially observe variable stars. Because even in New York City, you can yes. see a star change, surprisingly. Um, <laughs> Hear that, fellow New York? But you're right. That's something that we want to do with the other program. Like mm -hmm. going into middle schools, we want to establish relationships with, especially with schools in the area around Columbia, right. um, and try and go back again and again. And um, but also one thing we are noticing with our public program is that we are getting a class of regulars. Oh, which is kind of okay. Fun. And they're both um, retired people mm -hmm. and um, parents with kids. Okay. So there's a bunch of kids that we recognize again and again and again, oh, which is kind of fun because now um, we're starting to, you know, they start to recognize us, we start to recognize them, and so we check in every time they come. That's fantastic. So the community is building itself. The community is building itself. Cool. It's really fun. So have you noticed a difference in your outreach, Sebastian and, and Meredith, um, with the new tools that you have, um, and have you noticed a difference from doing outreach in a more sustained way? Well, I'll start, uh, if, you, if you don't mind, Meredith. Yeah. So the new tools that we got was mostly a lot of a wide variety of activities. So mm -hmm. when we started the, the outreach activities in primary school, before I joined the, the Astronomer Ambassador Program, we had a series of five activities that we were kind of doing in a loop, and it was always the same thing. They work well. I mean, the make your own comment with the kids. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing. They love it. But you know, even for us, it's good to have a bit of variety. And so the Astronomy Ambassador Program really gave us the tools to, you know, pick from a lot of activities and we try different things and they worked well, most of, mostly. Mostly. Can I ask, is there a brand, a, a new activity that you've um, tried from that resource that is like a, a now a go-to one? Uh, let's see. Well, some some of the... Uh, scale of the solar system that, that I used. So uh, we've done before the the scale of the solar system on a tape, uh, yeah. register tape. But yeah, the pocket solar system. The, the one, the, the pocket one. But then I uh, also, from the from those activities, we did uh, the full size, so where you, where you match the distance scale and the size scale at the same time. Oh, okay. Which, uh, which is a lot of fun to, to do outside, of course, because yeah. otherwise yes. you can't. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like a lot of, um, so in my department, I feel like a lot of the outreach we were doing was not very well directed and, and, and um, or coordinated. We would just kind of have the same five activities that we would do, you know, over and over again. Um, and uh, and it was like, okay, maybe what if the same people were to come, right? Like Summer was saying, we might get actually repeat visitors. Um, and if that ever happened, then, like, they'd have the same exercise, like, basically every time because we didn't really mix it up very much. Um, so I think for me, one of the, the best resources coming out of the program was just a wealth of new activities to do, um, as well as just a little bit more of an idea of, you know, maybe what, thinking about the goals of your outreach, who your audience is, um, tailoring each activity so it's not just, hey, people are going to show up, we're going to do a thing, and they're going to like it, whatever, but thinking a little more um, coherently about, like, the outcomes that you want and, uh, and how you can actually design your program to achieve that. You guys are looking at me like I don't exist. <laughs> sorry, sorry, no, I keep, I, I mute, I mute our end when we, you guys are talking. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, I want to, yeah, so, so uh, I think we should give a shout out to the people in the program who've developed this huge list of activities. Yeah. In particular, Andy Fracknoy seems to have been... Fire hose of resources. He's a, he's a bit of a fire hose of resources, but he likes make, just gathering resources. And this is something we talked about wearing my dot astronomy shirt. We talked about the last dot astronomy. Like, there's all these astronomy resources scattered. And so he's, he's, help, he's working to bring them all in one place. And so this is the, the moose. Does anyone right, yeah. remember what Moose stands for? Because I don't know. <laughs> it's a, a menu outreach opportunity, maybe it's students and educators. Sure. I'm sorry, we don't remember. Well, we know Moose, and if you look up Moose on the AAS <laughs> website, from the Astronomical uh, Society of the Pacific. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So they're yeah, right. uh, yes, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, um, but also I think they're hosting it on the American Astronomical Society site yeah. as mm -hmm. well. Um, 
those are uh, bleh, the words disappeared <laughs> from my head. Um, but the, uh, so they're actually hosted. All the resources we got, all the links. I mean, you didn't get all the physical things we got, but all the links and all the information they're working to put out there. So if you look for Moose on ASP or AAS. Uh, that'll take you to all of these astronomy resources, and I'll try and post it in the comment thread after the broadcast. Um, yeah, it's a huge, like, how, what, 157 activities. I would have guessed more. I don't know. Yeah, it's something like this. Uh, <laughs> but more than just the activities, it's a lot of information and resources on how to engage your audience, how to, uh, the terminology that you should really avoid, things like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so it's really full of uh, very useful things. And how to um, find a group that you want to do outreach with, how to mm -hmm. find local community partners. Yeah, I think, uh, so yeah, we're going to tap Andy Fracknoy for a future episode of Learning Space to, to talk more about That's it. That's a great idea. Or uh, several <laughs> episodes, because he does have a lot mm -hmm. to offer. Um, so, so yeah. Uh, did you guys have a favorite uh, particular either a hands-on activity or a topic that we talked about, um, maybe you guys last year or and us this year? Um, well, the activity on the second day that we um, saw, I don't remember what its name was, but it was the one where you wore the colored visors. Right. Yeah, um, so alien eyes. Seeing through alien eyes. Yeah, alien yeah. eyes. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, and so you had the different um, uh, objects, like a tree, a sun, a cloud, and a pool, but each one would be in every color of the rainbow, and you had to pick out the one that was color appropriate, so the green tree. Yeah. But then you had people wearing blue visors, green visors, and red visors. And so you had to have a conversation to figure out who, how they would um, be viewed by each of you. And, yeah, that was really slowly cool. slowly eliminating them. I really like that one. Yeah. So if I can give an advice about this activity, <laughs> yes. you really need to get the perfect color because we tried and oh. we kind of, you know, uh, we didn't buy the actual filters that we were supposed to. We just bought some acetate uh, sheets that we found in a uh, art craft and yeah. art store. So oh, it didn't point. work really well. It, yeah. uh, you need to get the right filters and colors. Okay. So this is where the resource Noted. itself is important. You exactly. need those specific filters. Follow the directions. <laughs> Follow the directions, of, yeah. Right. <laughs> My favorite activity was actually just like um, the first thing we did where we got into groups and one person was the teacher and then two mm -hmm. other people were the learners. And the teacher had to describe a drawing um, to the learner without showing them and without drawing it in the air with their hands. Um, and it, and, you know, we kind of did it in different stages where the teacher could see what the students were doing or couldn't see what the students were doing, um, and then he or she could see what the students were doing, and then the third level was where we could ask questions and have a dialogue. Um, and just seeing the amount of effort that you have to do to really get your point across is, it just was such a very, like, internalizing experience of that. <laughs> like, yeah. what really you know, what it really takes to be a good communicator. Yeah, because in that case, you could see, or at least could see at the end, the picture that your learner had in their head. Mm -hmm. And in yeah. reality, that doesn't, if you're just talking at somebody, you don't get like that. Like, draw a squiggly line on top of a triangle, and their idea of that is totally different from yours, it turns out. Right, <laughs> right. Just right. extra know. squares in there yeah. and everything. I mean, <laughs> yeah, how specific you had to be. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, they, they brought that up, or sorry, I realize now that they like looped back to that when they were talking about if you um, then are talking about, uh, I, don't, I can't remember what the example was, but a type of an object, if you're naming an object um, right. in the course of explaining something, what your audience is going to be picturing and trying to understand right. that they could be picturing multiple things. Yeah, like if we say really wave, we wave, think that's electromagnetic right. wave, right. and somebody else might think, yeah. Oh, you can't see my hand. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> wave that kind of wave. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's not just being aware of jargon, but even like normal words. Um, mm -hmm. Preconceived preconceived notions. Yeah. We have we all have so many preconceived notions, and you don't think about it until you have to try to explain something to somebody, and then you realize that your preconceived notions do not line up with theirs. <laughs> so knowing that going in is very powerful, because then you can at least step back and attempt to start kind of at a common ground square zero. Right, so so that need for constant assessment, mm -hmm. uh, I think, we really came across yeah. from that activity. Mm -hmm. um, we got some goodies too. I 
don't know oh, where yeah. my bag is, I've but got a huge bag that I have to okay. figure out how to get back to New York. <laughs> yeah, we got to stuff extra things in our check baggage. Um, there are card games uh, and card decks for sorting, mm -hmm. um, for uh, teaching astronomy. There were other things we got to play with that we didn't get to take home, like a little oh, light-up really tube. Cool light -up it, was, tube. It, was, it was kind of a discrepant event activity. And the little um, robot thingamajigs. At the <gasps> there were the little robot thingamajigs. I don't know what they're called, but they were adorable. All the wind-up little dancey guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. buy all of them. It, it was uh, that. Oh yeah, that was an interesting activity because we had to <coughs> write down. We got this little toy robot thing. They lined up. They made of gears and little clock parts, um, and they do something bizarre. And you had to play with it and write down what your initial reactions to it were. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was seeing yourself as the learner. I'm trying to remember what else kind of was the point. Yeah, because um, you want what you, you wanted to know about it. Right, right. What what do you want to know about it? So you if you can do what such an activity. You yeah, you can do such an activity with your learners to see how they think. I think from the start, so that was really cool. And you could do that probably do that with anything, but the robots were cool. <laughs> <laughs> particularly special and, and fantastic. Um, so about yeah. the card games that we got, I never had the chance to use it with mm. uh, kids. I was wondering if maybe Meredith had the chance. To with use it with the public or kids. The card games. The card games. The, oh, card the card games. games. No, I have. I've never really used the card games. But one thing I did use. Um, I don't know if they gave you guys this, but they. Um, it was to explain um, how radio velocity planet detections work. Um, where you have like a little foam ball and you stick like a toothpick planet in it, mm -hmm. and then you spin it on the table, and it turns out that it doesn't spin evenly, right? So if you have like a ball the toothpick sticking out of it, it's not going to spin symmetrically. It's going to spin and kind of have this funny wobble to it, mm -hmm. um, and that's the quote-unquote wobble technique or radial velocity technique for how we find planets around other stars. Um, so I, actually, I used that when I was talking to some undergraduates and they wanted me to... Um, some of them, they're all interested in astronomy, but they're not science majors. Um, and they have a little club at my, at my university. And they're like, yeah, we want um, grad students to come and give talks about stuff in science. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I used that as kind of an introduction to get them... So it wasn't just like lecturing at them for 15 minutes, because, you know, that's boring. So I think they like it because they play with it. So. <laughs> and you can yeah, change out the size of the planet. You can put a big fat one in there, and it you know wobbles a lot and like falls off the table. And then you put a little one in there, and it's almost you can't tell it's there. So it's a really nice analogy for for finding planets. We got to play with that, but we didn't get our own sets. Oh, okay. But I th I I I've, I have one at home. I think a similar one. Well, you yeah, can, I feel you like can I... do it with styrofoam balls. Yeah, you oh, get balls. <laughs> yeah, styrofoam balls and and little um like golf tees. I yep, think. Yeah. I think that's what they've made them out of. Yeah. Toothpicks. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. And play doh even for the little planets. Yeah. This sounds like an activity we'll have to do on the show because it is pretty pretty fun. <laughs> Another great activity for uh, planet transit. Uh, there's an app on that you can use on your phone or I think on a laptop. Uh, it's basically just something that uses your uh, laptop camera. You point your laptop camera at a source of light. You select the light with some kind of circle, and it draws uh, live, uh, a light curve. Oh. So you have the light curve of the light, and then you just pass a small sphere in front of your light, and then you get a transit. And it's it's really amazing to try that. What's it called? I, oh, <laughs> I think it's called Light Grapher. Light grapher. Light, light grapher. Uh, I can send a link after on on this. Summer thing. is pulling out her phone now. <laughs> to tell her. That's really cool. It's really cool. The difficulty is not to saturate the camera with a bright light. Yeah, so you I need to be far that. enough or dim light. I, I want to see it come up on the phone. Light grapher. <laughs> okay, so search for that, guys. The <laughs> no, um, actually, I mean it's getting. Cl I, I, this, I know this is kind of a shorter hangout than we usually do. Um, but I yeah. want to wrap up soon because I'm sure people want to go to dinner. Let me see. Kepler. Kepler Light Grapher. It's a flash applet. Yeah. There yeah. you go. Kepler Light Grapher. So from the Kepler science team. Awesome. <laughs> Yay, Nasty PO doing fantastic things. There's <laughs> <laughs> one little message there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So I think I think all of us would like to, we we like to thank the people running the program. Absolutely. The ASP and AAS have come together to put together a really great astronomy ambassadors program. If you are a a uh, student or a postdoc or young faculty in astronomy really strongly consider um, this program. If you don't have outreach experience, if you have a little outreach experience, 
um, anything you want to learn about doing outreach and, and building and being part of this community, I think they're going to try and do it at least one more January meeting. I sure hope so. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then at other, hopefully, you know, expand to other conferences as well. Look for the program, Astronomy Ambassadors, um, and, and apply because it's a really good workshop. It's completely uh, free also. They, mm -hmm. um, they they cover some of your travel expenses and, and stuff like that, just the hotel room, and they feed you. So <laughs> it's not an added expense to the meeting per se. And I would also say it's it's really great for people, um, even if outreach isn't your primary thing. Um, I think it's it's so important for people to you know, if they're going to do just a little outreach, to try to do it effectively. Um, so you know, it's just a two day thing. If you're already coming to AAS um, next year, you know, just consider trying to tack it on. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for reminding me. I have to fill out that reimbursement form. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fun. Okay. Um. I I want to. Uh. So there's some comments going by. Uh. Guido and Hugo Burnham are. Uh. Think that I should be on BBC Stargazing with Frank Cox, which I think is. <gasps> Do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> let's, let's to make that happen. Um. <laughs> from learning space to BBC is kind of a big jump, but thank you for for the thought. <laughs> you guys rock. Um. So, but yeah, I know we're we're probably gonna head off to dinner um, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, but thank you guys so so much for doing this. Um, hope, sorry, it was a little scattered at the Thanks beginning. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I will be I will probably be plugging uh, plugging all the work you guys do on the show, and would like to have you guys back to talk about the awesome work you're doing. Great. Uh, on the show. So uh, thank you all, and thank you guys for watching, even though it was a last minute at a weird time. Uh, thank you, Richard Drum, for editing the audio, which is probably terrible because we're <laughs> all in the same echoey room. Uh, and uh, thanks for watching Learning Space, everybody. Bye! Bye. <laughs> Hit the stop button.